Let us worship God. Make a joyful noise unto God, all ye lands. Sing forth the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say unto God, how terrible art thou in thy works. Though the greatness of thy power shall thine enemies submit themselves unto thee. All the earth shall worship thee and shall sing unto thee, and that they shall sing to thy name. Let's stand. <laughs> God and Heavenly Father, we praise you uh, for all your goodnesses to us. We thank you that you have uh, given our life a meaning and a purpose so that we can enjoy uh, our lives. We, we thank you and, and for the, that we have joy in our salvation, and we pray that you would cause us to, to take joy in it and to, to see the, the good side of life and the positive things that you've provided for us. And, and even in the dismal uh, moral circumstances of our culture, Help us to have faith that uh, your kingdom will prevail and that uh, uh, evil will not, that, that it will be put down and suppressed. And we long to see that day, and we're, we're, we're distressed uh, because we uh, do want to see that. But help us not to be discouraged. Help us to think in terms of the, the certainty of the victory of your kingdom in, in, in time and history. And we pray that you would uh, cause us to be obedient to it as though that were true today. We pray that you would uh, direct your church into to further uh, um, orthodoxy, into, into further obedience to you. And we pray for the unity of your church in terms of your truth. We pray particularly for those Christians who are persecuted. We thank you for their faith. We pray that you would give us a faith that could withstand the, the persecution and the, the difficulties and yet stand firm as, as they do in so many places around the world. We pray that you, for your uh, blessing on our time together and we pray that you would accept our words of praise and may the words... Thank you. 
Responsive reading is Psalter Selection number 42, found on page 639 of our Psalter booklet. Psalter Selection number 42. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shall be established heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. And the heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. For who in the heaven can be compared unto the Lord? The who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. O Lord God of hosts, who is a strong Lord like unto thee? For to thy faithfulness round about thee. Thou rulest the raging of the sea, when the waves thereof arise, thou stillest them. Thou hast broken Rahab in places, as one that is slain. Thou hast scattered thine enemies with thy strong arm. The heavens are thine, the earth also is thine. As for the world and the fullness thereof, thou hast founded them. The north and the south thou hast created them. Taylor and Herman shall rejoice in thy name. Thou hast a mighty arm, strong is thy hand, and high is thy right hand. Justice and judgment are the Blessed is the people that know the, the joyful sound. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. In thy name shall they rejoice all the day, and in thy righteousness shall they be exalted. For thou art the glory of their strength, and in thy favor our horn shall be exalted. For the Lord is our defense. And the Holy One of Israel is our King. Then thou spakest in vision to thy Holy One, and saidst, I have help, laid help upon one that is mighty. I have exalted one chosen out of the people. I have found David my servant, with my holy oil and I have anointed him. With whom my hand shall be established, my arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not exact upon him nor the sign of the wickedness of the wicked him. And I will beat down his foes before his face and plague them that hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him, and in my name shall his glory be exalted. I will set his hand also in the sea and his right hand in the rivers. He shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. I will also make him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed also will I make to endure forever, and his throne is the days of heaven. If his children forsake my law, and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgression with the rod, and their iniquity is strife. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Once have I sworn in my holiness that I will not lie unto David. 
It shall be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven. Let's now join in reciting together the Ten Commandments, which are at the front of our Psalter booklet. God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of thing that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Hear also the words of our Lord Jesus, how he said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Our scripture this morning is Psalm, excuse me, Luke 19, verses 1 through 10. Luke 19, the first 10 verses. Our subject is the salvation of Zacchaeus. Luke 19, verses 1 through 10. And Jesus, and Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him, and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide in thy house. And they made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus is in Jericho now. And as you recall, Jericho was destroyed by God 
uh, about 1400 BC as the Israelites entered the land uh, under Joshua. That Jericho was not rebuilt, though there were a couple attempts to do so uh, for some time. And that is actually a separate city from the modern city of Jericho. It's a few, uh, some distance away. Uh, because the old Jericho is actually a separate site, it's been, uh, ar- there have been a number of archeological digs there over the years beginning in the 19th century. After Jerusalem, it's the most excavated site in Israel. Uh, it's believed, it's been claimed to be the oldest known settlement. Uh, and they have found cl- a collapsed wall there. And they also found a large amount of stored grain there in those early ruins. And we're told uh, that uh, when Joshua approached the city, it was at harvest time. So that would make sense that a destroyed city would have a lot of grain stored that is still there in the, in the ruins. In Joshua 6, verse 26, a curse was pronounced on anyone who attempted to rebuild Jericho. And the curse was the loss of the rebuilder's younger son. And we do know, we're told later in the Old Testament, that someone, in fact, did try to rebuild Jericho. Uh, Jericho. That was during the reign of Ahab. We're talking now like four and a half centuries later. A man named Heel of Bethel rebuilt Jericho as a fortress. We're told this in 1 Kings 16, verse 34. It says there, He laid the foundation thereof in Abiram, his firstborn, and the gates thereof in his youngest son, Shigu. And this then we're told, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Joshua, the son of Nun. Stated in a very matter-of-fact way. If you're reading that in Joshua, or or, excuse me, in 1 Kings 16, you kind of pass over that. What's it mean? He he laid the uh, foundation in the blood of his son. He didn't sacrifice his son, but his son died in saying the prophecy was fulfilled. Here, four and a half centuries later, This man tries to rebuild Jericho, but there was a curse on it. If anybody did so, his son would be killed. Well, apparently he persisted, and not only was one son killed, but two sons were actually died. It's not said saying it doesn't say how they died, but it says he both of his sons died because he was rebuilding Jericho. By the way, the original curse did not say no one would ever rebuild Jericho. It's saying that uh, he who did would lose his young youngest son. A couple of centuries later, there was another settlement of Jericho that lasted apparently until the Babylonian captivity. And uh, the later Jerichos were built some distance away from the old Jericho. And that city of Jericho now, I believe, is in Palestinian control. Jericho is northeast of Jerusalem. I think it's more east than the north. And it's about six miles west of the Jordan River, and I think about an equal distance north of the Dead Sea. It was called the City of Palms. It was uh, a lot of trees there because there was plenty of water there. There were springs that were brought in through aqueducts that provided a great deal of water Uh, for the city and the surrounding plain. Uh, Josephus, who wrote after the fall of Jerusalem, a history of the Jewish people, said that Jericho was the richest area of the country. And it's referred to as the plain of Jericho in scripture. If you recall, uh, the last king on the throne of David, the, the, the last of the line of David, who uh, Zedekiah, at the t- who reigned at the time of uh, Jeremiah, he actually imprisoned Jeremiah in Jerusalem because he didn't want him telling the people that the city was going to fall to the Babylonians. 
when the Babylonians were about to conquer the city, somehow Zedekiah escaped, and we're told that he uh, was captured by the Babylonians on the plain of Jericho. So he'd gotten some distance away from the city, about halfway towards, uh, probably he was heading towards Moab. At the time, later on, Herod the Great, who was the Herod that, that died about the time of the birth of Christ, and was the great builder of the Herods, he had uh, built a wall around the city and uh, beautified the city. So he had developed Jericho quite a bit uh, to be what it was at the time of Christ. And then his son Archelaus had built a, a palace there. It was known for balsam plantations. I tried looking up what balsam is used for, and it's obvious that commentators don't pay a whole lot of attention. They'll tell you what was grown there and, it was, and that it was... Uh, um, known for growing balsam and other agricultural products, but balsam, it, apparently you could smell the balsam for a long distance away, and it's sort of a pine pitch product that used in, uh, um, was used in medicines and fragrances, and, and it's uh, still apparently used in essential oils. Um, but it was known for that, and these balsam plantations. Uh, but archaeologists and Bible commentators aren't that interested in exactly what did they use it for. I, I tried to do a, a little searching on that, and I didn't come up with, with very much. But it was valued, and Jericho was known for it. It had a very warm climate, and even in the winter, Josephus notes that, that even in the winter, the people could wear light clothing there. Um, it was a trading center. It was actually on the trade route between um, Damascus and Arabia. And as you recall, all the, when the uh, land was invaded by the Babylonians, they always came from the north because that was the avenue that provided them the, the, the best access down the Jordan Valley uh, because to the east were hills and mountains. It was too difficult. So the trade came from Mesopotamia and Arabia and it uh, often went through Jericho uh, on its way towards Jerusalem. So it was an agricultural center, it was a trade center. More important to the story of Zacchaeus, it was a center for tax collection. Wherever you have trade in the Roman Empire, you're gonna have tax collectors. And we're told that Zacchaeus was a publican. A publican was a contracted tax collector for Rome. If you wanted to be hated, and you wanted to be considered a collaborator, but you wanted a good income, you got a job with the Romans, collecting taxes from your own people. And that's what Zacchaeus did. And he was a chief tax collector, so he was prominent. He was a very important man in a city that was known for collecting taxes and a, a center for tax collection. Now, there were different kinds of tax collectors, and some focused more on trade and uh, foreign goods and others on domestic items and domestic trade. But being a chief, he might have been involved in both. Well, as Jesus approached Jericho, coming from north to south, he had left Perea and had now re-entered Judea, which was the center of opposition against him. And this is where the disciples had feared to go when he said, we're going up to Jerusalem. Uh, he had said that before he got to Jericho, but when the Bible refers to up to Jerusalem, it's referring to the elevation of Jerusalem. It, Jerusalem was in the hills. Jerusalem is at an elevation of over 2,400 feet. Jericho was actually <coughs> uh, at a below sea level, over 800 feet below sea level. So there's like 33, 3,400 feet difference between Jericho and uh, Jerusalem. Uh, so Jesus entered into Jericho. He would have been passing through a, a city gate into a more crowded place. And so there were crowds there who wanted to see Jesus. And as he entered so it's important to remember, as he entered Jericho, he was entering a city not only of tax collectors, but also a city that had a lot of priests in it. 
it was only about a six hour walk to Jerusalem. And so a lot of Jerusalem could only hold so many people. And there were a lot of priests and they would work in uh, Jerusalem in ships. So a lot of them lived in Jericho. And when it was their time to serve in Jerusalem, they could be there in a day. And we know that Jesus created a buzz wherever he went. Early on, the, early in his ministry, we're told the fame of him went throughout the land. And be, that's before he ever left Galilee. And we said that word fame meant the, the news of him, the buzz of him. So wherever Jesus went, he attracted immediate attention. And we're seeing even in Perea that we keep hearing reference to the crowds, the multitudes. Wherever Jesus was, he drew a, a crowd. Um, and this crowd would have, when they found out this is Jesus of Nazareth, they would have, uh, they would have known him. Here's, this is that miracle worker we've been hearing about for so long. There was a long-standing debate by this time that had been going on for three years. Is this some sort of a prophet? Is he the Messiah? He, um, and Jesus, by the way, this uh, Jericho wasn't far from Bethany, which is he's now going to go to the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Um, we're told in John eleven forty seven that there had been an order issued that whoever saw <coughs> Jesus was to report it to the chief priests and Pharisees. The purpose of that report was that they wanted to arrest him. So when people who had heard this in a town of priests that were supposed to report on Jesus if we see him, now he's in town. Not only the miracle worker, is he a prophet, is he the Messiah, uh, but he's, here's the man we're supposed to report on. So Jesus would have drawn attention to himself as soon as his presence was known. And we're introduced then immediately to Zacchaeus, chief among the publicans. And we're also told he was rich. The fact that he was rich tells us something about Zacchaeus. The Romans demanded a certain amount. They would estimate the population, they would have for the trade, and they would tell the, these publicans, these contractors, this is how much you should be collecting. And it was up to the publicans to collect it. Now, they could make a decent living doing that. They could also get rich doing it if they extorted more than what the Romans really required. Because if, you, if a tax collector came to you and says, you have to pay so much in taxes, you didn't have much of recourse. There wasn't really a due process for someone who was not a Roman citizen. So they basically were extorting money from people under threat of arrest or legal trouble, in which case you could lose everything. And so they were extorting money from people, and they were known for this. And here you have a Jew working for the, not only working for the Romans, but he was a rich Jew, and he was a chief amongst the publicans. So he was good at what he did, and he was likely the most hated man amongst the Jews in, in Jericho. And when the publicans had asked some, very early in Jesus' ministry for direction, in, uh, no, excuse me, they'd asked John the Baptist very, you know, very early on, like three years ago, they said, you know, what would we must do to give us direction? And John the Baptist had told a group of publicans then extort no more than that which is appointed you. In other words, you can do your job for the Romans, but you have to do it fairly, and you cannot use your power as a publican to cheat people and enrich yourself. So here we're introduced to Zacchaeus, chief of the publicans in Jericho, and he was rich. So that tells us that he had been extorting money from people. Now, it's been debated whether Zacchaeus knew that it was Jesus. <coughs> Verse 3 suggests he was trying to see who, who it was that had created such a stir. But suddenly, as Jesus came in to the city, which would have been a, a rather confined 
uh, arrangement of houses and buildings, there was suddenly a crowd. And we're told that uh, Zacchaeus was a little of stature in verse 3. Uh, if you grew up in the church, uh, when I did, you were familiar with the song, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. It was very popular with, amongst kids when I grew up. Um, he couldn't see over the crowds. And he decided uh, he probably got ahead of the crowd to see what all the excitement was, and he climbed into a sycamore tree for a better vantage point. It's not clear if he climbed the tree to, to actually to see Jesus or whether he was uh, just curious as to what all the commotion was about because it says he went, climbed it to see Ju Jesus who he was. At any rate, we're not even told why Jesus was in Jericho. He didn't necessarily have to go through Jericho on his way to Jerusalem or to Bethlehem. The only other incident we're given of this, of his passing through Jericho, is blind Bartimaeus, and we talked about him last week. So the only incidents recorded of Jesus passing through Jericho are two acts of mercy. And it seems that these acts of mercy were the reason for his passing through there. Um, Matthew and Mark accounts of Bartimaeus are preceded by Christ's words about serving others. There were, so there were a lot of priestly families in Jericho. At the other extreme, it was a center for tax collection and full of publicans. When Jesus arrived in Jericho, he did not head for a priest's home. He didn't go to talk to the priest. Jesus saw Zacchaeus and he spoke to him. Zacchaeus, of all those present, was probably the least regarded, the least respected man in uh, Jericho. Zacchaeus observed Jesus and was curious. But he was not likely to approach someone known as a rabbi. If he knew it was Jesus or if he recognized Jesus, or if he heard them or him referred to as Jesus, he probably wasn't likely to approach Jesus because he was hated. He was basically ostracized from Jewish society as a Roman collaborator. And he knew the Jews held him in contempt. Zacchaeus had self-consciously been willing to give up social acceptance for the money that tax collection allowed him. And he was chief amongst the publicans. Yet Jesus, interestingly enough, chooses him as one that he's going to bring into the kingdom. Not long before Jesus had told the uh, disciples that the last shall be first. And here was Zacchaeus, the last person most Jews would want, in any case, to deal with or to speak to. And he's approached by Jesus. Jesus told Zacchaeus to come down from the tree because he intended to be a visitor in his home, likely to stay over the night. Jesus said, I must, not just I would like. Jesus basically invited him and says it's necessary. And of course it's necessary because it was a, a lesson to us uh, ever since in the word of God as recorded in Luke. So Zacchaeus hurried down from the tree and received Jesus joyfully, we're told. The reaction of the crowd in this town full of priests was disapproval. Jesus, the rabbi, because even the, Jew, any of the Jews would have considered him a rabbi, a teacher, a Jewish rabbi did not go into the house of a sinner, they said. So Jesus was not doing what a religious, other religious leaders would approve of. And they assumed that Jesus was polluted by his association with sinners. That was a very, would have been a typical attitude of people who are around priests a lot. But pretty much a typical Jewish attitude. Now, we're not 
told anything about the conversation that, that ensued between Jesus and Zacchaeus. Whether this was overnight or after a few hours, we're not told anything about what Jesus um, said to Zacchaeus in his home. In verse 7, we see the crowd complaining of the decision of Jesus to stay in the house of Zacchaeus and fraternize with someone like Zacchaeus. And then verse 8 is a statement made by Zacchaeus in the presence of Jesus. And this re represents a promise of restitution. So it's likely at their emergence from the house. It appears to be a public statement made by Zacchaeus in the presence of Jesus. Zacchaeus makes two vows. And the second vow he made was anything that he had wrongly taken, he would restore fourfold. This is restitution, which is part of Old Testament law. There's a real inclination in to um, make forgiveness something that's not in Scripture. When Jesus died for our sins, he paid the penalty for the sins. He didn't just say, I forgive you because you say you're sorry. He actually had to pay the penalty. That was justice. Restitution is saying, no, God's order has to be restored. If you steal from someone, you not only have to restore what you stole, but you have to restore more. There is a penalty involved. So you're penalized what you hope to gain, minimally. The minimal restitution was double. The thing stolen and it's equal in value. And the... That penalty was paid to the victim, not to the state, not to the court, but actually paid to the victim. So the, the victim was financially compensated. We might call that um, damages, not only uh, or, um, restoring what was t taken away from the victim, but also damages. Uh, in Exodus 22, one, there were varying levels of restitution. Exodus 22, 1 says that if someone stole an, an ox, that he had to restore fivefold, sheep fourfold. Different animals represented different values and different returns on them over a period of time. Again, the, the case laws are examples of justice as guidelines, which means that there could be a flexible schedule and, and of restitution made. For instance, the oxen was restored fivefold. An oxen was valuable every day of its existence because oxen were work animals. They pulled carts and so forth. It was the most, one of the most common work animals. So if you went for a period of time without your oxen, you were in immediately at a disadvantage and it cost you money the time that oxen was gone. So this meant that, that, that you had to restore that auction plus the fact that you had taken away someone's, uh, something absolutely necessary to someone's income. Uh, sheep were fourfold. By the way, there have been similar laws to that that doesn't, don't necessarily follow that, but the idea that some things are so valuable you don't steal them. For instance, horse theft in the Old West. If a man was with, had, if you stole someone's horse, he couldn't just necessarily dip into his pocket and buy another one. And that horse was necessary to his survival. What's a, a man in the West that had to go long distances, perhaps that was his work, if it was a cowboy and a cowpuncher, that was his work horse. Uh, how's he going, what's he going to do? How's he going to earn a living at all? He's basically out of a job if he doesn't have a horse. So horse theft was extremely serious crime in the Old West. Now, the fourfold probably indicates that a lapse of time from some of the theft had taken place. And in fact, when you go without something for a period of time, its loss is compounded because you don't have that that value and the multiplying effect of capital or of value or its usefulness to you is, is now lost. So the whole idea of restitution was that 
you had to be penalized in a way that hurt the thief, that discouraged you from theft. Well, Zacchaeus said, I'm going to restore fourfold. And Jesus thought that his application of restitution was uh, sufficient. And the first thing that Zacchaeus actually said was he promised to give half his goods to the poor. So there was going to be specific restitution to individuals, and then half of his wealth was going to go to the poor. Paul suggested something similar to this in Ephesians 4.28. He said, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. See, often the victims of theft cannot be found. In, in Paul's instance in Ephesians 4, the, con, the convert to Christianity had once stolen. Now his only asset that he gave was his ability to work. So Paul says, well, okay, now you work, and since you can't find your victim, you can now give to the poor. And you can give to those who are in need. That will be your form of of restitution. Somewhat similar to the Catholic idea of penance, but the, the idea of penance was uh, often diverted into, into meaningless acts and not necessarily true restoration. But it's a valid concept that if you expect to be forgiven, there are certain things that you should do. You have to change your behavior and you have to try to right the wrong if, if you're able to. So the public and Zacchaeus in all likelihood, he says he's going to return fourfold from anyone he stole from, but in all likelihood there were many people he could not find. He could not make restitution, for instance, to a foreign traveler that he had taken a great amount of wealth for. So if he didn't know the extent of his extortion or if he could not, did not have access to the victims themselves, he promised to give half of his wealth to the poor. <clears throat> this was a restitution as well. It wasn't just an act of, of charity or piety. Zacchaeus, after having spoken with Jesus, wanted no part of what he had extorted. His whole life had changed around. His whole attitude was, I want no part of what I've stolen, and I'm willing to make that good. I'm willing to give it back with a penalty purpose and intent of Zacchaeus' life had been changed. Zacchaeus, the chief publican, the, the head of the local IRS office, so to speak, was giving up the proceeds of his theft with a hefty penalty. Now, as a publican, he would have made a good income, so he would have had a, a, a certain amount of wealth to begin with. Uh, just for being a publican, if he just did what the Romans required. There was enough in there for him to make a living. I mean, he was, after all, a government employee. He would have been comfortable just doing his job honestly. So he had personal wealth that he had extorted that he could give away, plus he had wealth of his, he, his own rightfully gained that he could use to compensate his victim. And Jesus recognized that what he's doing was right. He was not like Ananias and Sapphira later who promised God something and then held back. It sounded good, but they didn't really do what, exactly what they said they were going to do. They held some back. Now the praise of Jesus is noteworthy. He said, this day is salvation come to this house for as much as as he also is a son of Abraham. Our modern idea of cheap forgiveness, that forgiveness is just words, just forgive and forget, is, is, is really not a biblical idea. Uh, G. Campbell Morgan said that Zacchaeus went from having revenue the means of self-enrichment to righteousness the method, method of self-abnegation. Self-abnegation is basically giving up your selfishness. So Zacchaeus realized his life was evil. 
that he had been doing what was wrong. He, as he had given up being part of the Jewish community, a respected member of the Jewish community by his collaboration with the Romans and being a publican, he was hated. And so he figured as long as I'm hated by the Jews, I might as well get what I can from them. And so he had been extorting people right and left. He'd gotten rich doing it, and now he says, my whole life has been built on a fraud. All this wealth I have is ill-gotten gain. And after talking to Jesus, he realized, I have to give it back with a penalty. And he said he was willing to do that. The evidence of the, his salvation, the evidence of the change in Zacchaeus was his repentance. And repentance is not just words. It's not just what you say. Repentance is a change in your life. It's a turning away from sin to righteousness. And what Zacchaeus was describing here was his cha change in to righteousness and the righteous restitution he was making to legally right his wrong in the eyes of God. So in the presence of Jesus, Zacchaeus could <coughs> not rationalize his theft. He couldn't rationalize its retention. So he was repentant. He wanted to rid himself of his ill-gotten gain, even if, it caught, if he had to dip into his own fortune to do it in order to make restitution. Zacchaeus, as a Jew though, was aware of what restitution was and why rest got, restitution was required. He would have been familiar with that law. Now people, to give another example, people are uneasy when in the uh, epistle of James, he speaks of justification by works. But James there is speaking of how a believer is judged. Now what justification it, it means is a declaration of righteousness. But there are different kinds of uh, declarations of righteousness. There's a right declaration of righteousness by God and divine his divine justice and his declaration of righteousness for us is not because of anything we do. It's entirely of grace. It's received by faith. So we're not justified by works by God, but only by grace that we receive by faith. The Reformation emphasized this doctrine of justification by grace received through faith alone. But how do you look at someone and decide whether they're the real deal or not? How do you look at someone and saying, this is a godly man? How do we declare men righteous? How do we recognize someone as righteous? By Jesus says, by their fruits. It's by what they do. In other words, it's, 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 it, it is by our works. This is not a, God doesn't justify us by our works, but we justify men. People are apparent to all concerned because of what they do. We've all known people who talk a good line. I mean, we see this in po politicians all the time. They talk a good line, but their fruit is evil. Okay? Our, our actions speak as to whether we are godly or not. Or <coughs> men, our works declare us righteous, or they declare us to be wicked. Zacchaeus vowed his intent publicly before Jesus. His vow was an act that declared he was changed and that truly he was a son of Abraham. He knew the responsibilities he had as a child of Abraham. And this same language of son of Abraham is used later in the New Testament to refer to Christians. Jesus was in a rich city. His only recorded actions are to blind Bartimaeus and to a hated tax collector. These were now part of his kingdom. Why these two incidents? <coughs> a, a, a blind man that people walked past all the time and a tax collector anybody hated. Of, of, of the people in Jericho before the arrival of Jesus, these are two people you would have thought that were not particularly important to the ministry of Jesus. Yet he singles out this poor wretched beggar and 
one of the most one of the most hated men in town mm -hmm. and he says my kingdom is coming to you and they were changed we don't understand the progress of Christ's kingdom or why he uses some <coughs> men and not others we only see the results like the leaven in the parable of the kingdom we see the results of the yeast and the bread but we can't see it working Luke is the only New Testament writer to tell us of Zacchaeus. It's interesting that Luke was a physician. Luke knew of the medicinal qualities of the balsam for which Jericho was famous. But he, he doesn't mention that. All he mentions are the acts of mercy by Jesus. All that's mentioned to us are the stories of blind Bartimaeus who who professed Jesus to be the son of David, the Messiah, and the salvation come to the tax collector. Christ's pronouncement of salvation, we should know, was itself an act of grace to Zacchaeus. He didn't just commend Zacchaeus. He said, Zacchaeus, you are truly a child of Abraham. You're as true a Jew as there ever was. Imagine saying that to a, a tax collector for the Romans. The hated tax collector found grace and restoration as a son of Abraham by the son of David. And so the, the mercy of, 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 of God comes to us sometimes in, in ways that we don't fully understand. And it happens in an... In, and the, and the grace of God and the increase of his kingdom happens throughout history in different ways. And we, it's kind of like the leaven. You look at the loaf and after a time and it's, it's raised, but you don't see it happening. We can look back at history and the kingdom of God is bigger than ever. There are more Christians alive today than have ever been alive. And whenever I say that, people always say, yeah, but there's a lot of bad theology. Well... Look at the early church. There was all kinds of strange theology uh, with Gnosticism and, and people literally punished themselves as higher mm -hmm. spirituality. There was just a lot of weird stuff going on. And, and, but the, the, a lot of these things and these doctrines have been settled and, and there, there's better theology in a lot of ways available to us even than in the, in the early years of the church when these things were still being debated. And so the progress is very real. And yet we look at the world around us and some of, we also look at the problems and our culture are very real and very apparent. But if you look at what things were at the time of Christ or even later at the time of the disciples, they had a whole world to which they had to bring this message of the kingdom of God. They had a whole world to which to bring this gospel. And especially when they went out of uh, Palestine, now they had to start talking about something people had no inclination even existed. They had to talk about a Jew and things about Jewish history, and the attitude was, so what? What does this even have to do with us? They had a terrible burden and difficulty That's right. describing the importance of Jesus to other cultures, yeah. and yet they did so. They would have much preferred if Jesus said, just stick here and try to explain to the Jews about their own history and about their own salvation. Yeah. At least they understood the context of what the apostles were talking about. So the grace of God comes to Zacchaeus. Why? We don't know. But we do know that it, it does come, and, and it all works to the furtherance of his kingdom. And we don't understand the advance of the kingdom, but Jesus still tells us, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And that's our primary duty. Whatever we are as, you know, and our responsibilities to family, to community, to work, and so forth, our first responsibility, we're, we're told, is to seek the advance of the kingdom. Let's pray. Our most good and gracious God and Heavenly Father, we praise you for your goodnesses to us. We ask now that you would uh, uh, bless our, our day of rest. We thank you that we have the opportunity to rest from our labors, secure in the fact that you care for us, and help us to remember your salvation this day and the good that we have because of what you have done for us that we cannot do and could, not ever, could never do for ourselves. 
Help us to understand the immensity of your kingdom. And we acknowledge that we don't always understand why your kingdom advances the way it does. But uh, uh, help us to sit back and look at the progress it has made and give us a confidence that your kingdom is marching forward and that all the problems of the world are not its, its leading to its dissolution, but to the real solution to the advance of your kingdom, of which we believe will overcome and, and, and conquer all men and, and nations. And we look forward to that, to seeing part of that progress, at least in our lifetimes. And we pray that you would make us more faithful so that your kingdom could advance in our lives, in our family's life, and in our sphere of influence. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn, <coughs> excuse me, is uh, Praise to the Lord, which is 337, hymn 337. Let us stand and sing all verses of Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. God the Son and God the Holy Spirit bless you and keep you, guide and protect you this day and always. Amen.